Hi everyone, this is Maverick Pot, the Chemistry Guru. Now in periodicity, we need to be familiar with certain trends involving physical properties and chemical properties of period 3 elements. So in this video, we want to discuss the melting point trend of period 3 elements. Now the melting point trend of period 3 elements it is shown here from sodium all the way to chlorine. We know that as I slowly move across the period from left to right, I'm changing from a metal, eventually it becomes a non-metal. So we will expect a very big difference in terms of melting point because it becomes a very different type of substance. So therefore, the factors affecting the melting point will differ greatly depending on what type of substance the element is. So let us use sodium as a benchmark. Actually, the melting point of sodium it is relatively low. So towards the bottom, we will mark sodium and we will use sodium as a benchmark and later when we consider the non-metals, the melting point of the elements involving phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine will be with respect to sodium. Now, from sodium, magnesium to aluminum, we would expect an increase in the melting point. But from sodium to magnesium, the increase in the melting point, it is a lot more significant. So that's why I draw a steeper gradient here. From sodium to magnesium, the melting point will be way higher. Magnesium to aluminum, the melting point increases, but it is not as significant. Aluminum to silicon. Now silicon, we know that this is a non-metal, but it exists as a dry molecule. So in this case, when we consider the melting point of period 3 elements, the melting point for silicon happens to be the highest. Then, involving the melting point of phosphorus. Melting point of phosphorus, actually, it is slightly below sodium. Melting point of sulfur, it is actually slightly above sodium. And finally, the melting point of chlorine, it is much lower than sodium. So this will decrease all the way down. So that is the reason why I think it is a good idea to use the melting point of sodium as a benchmark so that later when we consider melting point of phosphorus, we know it is slightly lower than sodium. Sulfur, it is slightly above sodium then chlorine, it comes down here. So if we use the melting point of sodium as a benchmark, then we will be able to determine the melting point for the non-metal elements more easily. Then of course, knowing the melting point trend without being able to explain the melting point trend, it is not particularly interesting. So let us try to go through that. Now the first three elements will be our metals, sodium, magnesium, and aluminum. So we know that the attraction that is holding all these metal atoms together will be our metallic bonds. Now for metallic bonds, we know that it is the attraction between positively charged metal cations and the sea of delocalized electrons. Now the factor affecting the strength of the metallic bond inside this metal will be the valency. Now valency is essentially the number of electrons each metal atom can delocalize into the sea of delocalized electrons. So if I look at sodium, which is in group 1, so it will only delocalize one electron. So the valency for sodium will be 1. So for sodium, what this means is the metal cation of sodium will just be a plus one charge and you have a smaller sea of delocalized electrons so the metallic bond inside sodium will be much weaker as compared to let's say for example for aluminum aluminum because it is in group 13 so therefore it has a valency of three it can delocalize three electrons so therefore it can form al3 plus which is a more positively charged metal cation and you have a bigger sea of delocalized electrons so in terms of the strength of metallic bond we would expect the metallic bond in aluminum to be much stronger as compared to sodium. So therefore, the melting point trend will increase from sodium to magnesium to aluminum. Now, because of sodium being only valency 1 and the metallic bond in sodium, it is actually relatively weak. So that is the reason why the melting point of sodium, even though it is considered as a metal, and in principle, it should have strong metallic bonds, but because it is only in group 1, so therefore, the metallic bond it is way weaker that is the reason why the melting point of sodium, it is actually unusually low. You notice the melting point of sodium is actually in the region of simple molecules. So it is not because sulfur has an unusually high melting point. It has a higher melting point than a metal. Actually, that's not really the case. The one which is weird, it is actually not sulfur. The one which is weird is sodium. Sodium has a unusually low melting point. So the melting point for metals, which is related to metallic bond, which is in turn related to valency, we have talked about this. Now the next one is silicon. Now silicon, we know that this is a giant covalent compound or a giant molecule. 
Now for giant molecules or giant covalent compounds, we would expect the melting point to be very high because of strong and extensive covalent bonds within that molecule. So in silicon, all the atoms are connected to each other via covalent bonds and the covalent bonds are extended throughout the entire molecule. So we say that this is strong and extensive covalent bonds within a giant molecule and it will require a lot of energy to overcome all these strong and extensive covalent bonds then the melting point of silicon it is expected to be very very high. Now for the melting point of period 3 elements, the melting point for silicon happens to be the highest amongst this set but I think it is important for us to keep in mind we don't want to overgeneralize and say that since in this case silicon it is a dry molecule and the melting point of silicon it is the highest even higher than that of the metals inside period 3. So does it mean that all giant molecules will have higher melting point as compared to all metals. Now the idea it is an overgeneralization. We don't want to have too much of a deduction just based on one set of information. So in general, we say that metals, the melting points are considered as high because metallic bond it is considered as strong. And then for giant molecules, because of the strong and extensive covalent bonds, the melting point is also considered as high because covalent bonds are also strong. But usually we don't try to compare metallic bond versus covalent bond, which bond is stronger. We just say that metallic bond is strong, covalent bond is strong. So therefore metals will have high melting point and giant molecules will also have high melting point. Now, even ionic compounds, the idea is the same. We say that ionic bonds are strong, so therefore the melting point of ionic compounds are also high. Usually we don't try to compare metallic bond versus covalent bond versus ionic bond. So I think it is important in chemical bonding and in periodicity, keep in mind, in this case, silicon, the melting point happens to be the highest, but it is only in this example, we don't want to overgeneralize thinking that the melting point of any dry molecule must therefore be higher than the melting point of any metal. That is a serious misconception which we want to avoid. Now moving on, Phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine. Now the molecular formula for all these simple molecules are as shown. Alright, so we have this here. Phosphorus, it is P4. Sulfur, it is S8. Chlorine, it is Cl2. Now for these three elements, they exist as simple molecules. And since all of them are nonpolar, so therefore the dominant intermolecular interaction will be involving nonpolar interaction, which we can say that it is instantaneous dipole induced dipole interaction. Some of us will refer to this as dispersion forces or van der Waals forces. Alright, so I've written this as instantaneous dipole induced dipole interaction or IDID attraction. Of course, we can always use dispersion forces or van der Waals forces. Effectively, they mean the same thing. It is the attraction between nonpolar simple molecules. Now, the factors affecting IDID attraction in this case will be the electron cloud size because the bigger the electron cloud size, the more polarizable it will be. So therefore, the stronger the ID-ID attraction and it requires more energy to overcome. So therefore, the melting point will be higher. Alright, so ID-ID, it is related to electron cloud size. And if I look at the molecular formula, P4 versus S8 versus Cl2, because these three elements, they are next to each other in the same period. So in terms of electron cloud size, each atom roughly have the same size. So we can roughly say that the size of one phosphorus atom and the size of one sulfur atom and the size of one chlorine atom, it is roughly the same. So approximately the size of P4 will be double the size of Cl2 and in turn the size of S8 will be double the size of P4. So we actually don't really need to calculate the MR, we can compare the size of electron cloud just by comparing S8 should be bigger than P4 which is in turn larger than Cl2. So the electron cloud size will be in that order. So therefore, the polarizability of the electron cloud will also be in the order. The strength of the ID-ID attraction will also be in that order. So therefore, the melting point will also be in that same order. The melting point of S8 element will be greater than that for P4, which will be in turn greater than that for Cl2. Alright, so that was the discussion involving the melting point trends of period 3 elements. So if you have learned something useful from this video, please give me the thumbs up like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel for more weekly video lessons. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.